Students are returning to university and college campuses across New Mexico. And here at New Mexico in Focus, we were curious about how some of the issues surrounding the transition to the new Trump administration might make their way into classroom discussions and curriculum this spring. So we invited professors and instructors from various departments to sit down this week with producer Sarah Gustavus to tell us how they are handling race, ethics, voting rights, and other issues in their classes. I have a great group of instructors from UNM here with us this week. Professor Michael Rocca from the UNM Political Science Department, thanks for being here. Happy to be here. Thank you. Rafael Martinez, a PhD candidate in American Studies, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for having us. Finney Coleman, a professor of English in the English and Language, English Language and Literature Department, thanks for being here. Thank you for having us. And Harry Van Buren, a professor in the UNM Anderson School of Management. Good morning. Mike, let's start with you. You okay. teach American politics, Intro to American Politics. Last fall must have been an exciting time to be working with students as the news was changing day by day. How did that change what was happening in the classroom for you? It, it changed it daily. So I never really needed to change much lectures. First of all, let me give you some back, backdrop. Is that I had 150 students ranging from freshmen to, soft, uh, to fr freshmen to seniors of all sorts of majors. Most were political science majors, about freshmen and sophomore, but we also had biology and math and engineering. So it was a really uh, a, a very diverse crowd I had in the classroom, which made it very exciting. They were thoughtful, they were uh, analytical, they were interested, they were attentive, they showed up, and it was exciting. And, and like you, you've, you've suggested, every single day there was something new to talk talk about. All I really needed to do was check the news the night before or check the news on the way to, uh, to class and there would be some topic straight out of the election news that would relate to something we were talking about that day. We were watching debate coverage, we were covering, we were looking at the latest campaign ads, we were looking at public opinion data. It was all in real time and what was made the, what I thought the class really fun and interesting is that, is that we could always relate it to whatever I was talking about that day. Whether it was, I brought a list here, whether it was Congress, the presidency, civil rights and civil liberties, the judiciary, public opinion, participation, election and campaigns, there was always something to talk about. Vinny, what about you? Did you? Well, I had a, a, a similar experience. Uh, this is the first semester that I've ever taught a class that was comprised solely of freshmen, a freshman learning community. And then an upper level literature course, or well, an upper level um, Black Lives, Lives Matter course, um, and also graduate students. So it was interesting to, to teach all three different levels, if you will, at the university, roughly about the same uh, subject matter. Uh, it was uh, about race in America and, and race in American politics. And like you, uh, my students came with remarkable energy this, this past semester and were very interested, very focused, um, and they had great uh, opinions and, and diverse opinions, and that was a very interesting uh, learning environment for us last fall. Did the outcome of the election change what you were talking about in that final month of your Black Lives Matter course? It certainly did. I mean, I thought that we would be speaking about um, the differences between gender politics and racial politics and the like, and, um, and, and the first uh, uh, woman president. Uh, I think uh, I confess that I thought that that, that that was the way the election was going to go. Um, but when it didn't go that way, um, I found myself back into the kind of context and about how the government works and about um, accountability and checks and balances and, you know, to talk to students about their concerns about what might happen in the country now that we had an election that many of them just didn't uh, anticipate. Rafael, you teach about Latino and Chicano movements in the United States. What are some ways that you brought in the events of last fall into the classroom? Yeah, definitely. Um, I feel like, you know, talking about social movements, just as, uh, as my colleague here on the, on the right, um, talking about the idea of having to, like, think about social movements in this particular uh, political movement is so crucial, you know, because um, most of my students were freshmen as well. And when I brought in some stuff from the uh, civil rights period, a lot of them were like, I can't relate to that material. Like, I, I can't understand what they're saying. Why would they make such radical, you know, statements of, of some sort and things like that? 
But when you actually put it into the context of what's going on today, I think they understand why there are people back in the civil rights were saying such things, but also why people currently, young people today, are also taking a stand against what's currently happening in our country. So I think more than ever, it's important to talk about social movements, to talk about activism, organizing, and you know, thinking, uh, having, producing students that are critically thinking about these things. And those historic connections are really important. Perry, you teach business ethics. Right. Ethics is in the news every day right now. Absolutely. We're going to get to where we're looking ahead in, in a few minutes, but mm -hmm. let's go back to the fall when you were mm -hmm. talking with students about um, Donald Trump as a candidate had not released his tax returns. Right. And there were all these questions about mm -hmm. potential conflicts of interest as a candidate. Right. How did that change what you were talking about in the classroom? It was really interesting because I had a freshman learning community as well, and that's a very different classroom uh, context. Uh, this was their first election where they were plausibly uh, voters. And a lot of what we talked about there were sort of the basic uh, issues related to uh, civics and uh, politics and uh, things like that. But then I also taught a MBA elective uh, course uh, that focused on ethics and compliance in organizations. And one of the things that you talk about quite a bit are conflicts of interest and the ways that, say, UNM manages uh, them. So we have to file as faculty members uh, statements every year about our conflicts of interest. And even yesterday during uh, the press conference, uh, President-elect uh, Trump said he didn't have a conflict of interest. Now, ethically, that's not true. The conflict of interest exists whether you are exempt uh, from the conflict of interest law or not. So what I found with my MBA students was we were having pretty sophisticated conversations about how, we, how things that were going on in the campaign then would affect the kinds of topics that we uh, talked about. Vinny, there's a lot of... Um controversy out there right now, and we're hearing about these terrible things that are happening on social media, of people saying things back and forth. Um, how do you handle disagreements and views in the classroom? How do you moderate those conversations? Well, I think the first thing that you have to do as an instructor, and I think all of my colleagues will agree, you have to create a safe place mm -hmm. um, in the classroom so that students with divergent um, opinions feel free um, to, to speak. And when you have that environment, um, it, that mitigates a lot of the um, trying to get people to have an opportunity to speak without being, um, you know, judged. And uh, I think if you do that groundwork early on, it's a lot easier. Uh, we didn't have uh, a great deal of conflict. I think even people who found themselves um, opposed politically found a way to talk about that, that opposition civilly and without, uh, without any uh, rancor, which was... I have to confess, surprising to me. But I, but again, I think the energy that, uh, la that that this election produced last fall had an impact on the kind of dis discourse that we were having in our classrooms, and I think it had a positive impact, oddly enough. Mike, what's your goal in yeah. helping students have those conversations? Yeah, I, my goal is to teach them how to think about politics, how to analyze politics. Um, what I try to do is, I, I, and Finney's exactly right, you try to build an environment, particularly in large, it actually doesn't really matter what size the class is, but, but um, in a class with 150 students in it, you, you, you really have to make sure that you're orchestrating, you're creating an environment in which students do feel safe to participate. And what I try to do is I try to encourage them to come into the door and think about politics from a political science perspective. Let's talk about things like, um, uh, why are the polls shifting? You know what are what are the, what are effective? What have been the effective messages from either campaigns? What have the messages have been working? What about them have not been working? Uh, why are public opinions shifting in the way it is? Um, the, let's talk about the electoral college. You know, let's think about is the electoral college the best way to think about uh, to to uh, elect the president of the United States? Um, should we go to a popular vote? Those are the sorts of agreements and disagreements that I'd like to have in the in the classroom, as opposed to. Things like, is Obamacare right or wrong? I'm more interested in, okay, so now we're going moving forward. Let's say this semester, we're going to look carefully at the bill process in the, in the Congress mm -hmm. and to see, okay, what, what do the Republicans do now in order to change Obamacare? And what are, how might the Democrats go about preventing that from happening? And so it's become, we approach it from a more of an analytical standpoint. And I, and I agree with Finney, too, is that, you know, I was a little nervous going into this excited. I was always, I love, I love teaching a class in the middle of an election. <laughs> I love it. And it's, but I was always, there's a little, there's, there's always the chance that there's going to be disagreement, um, the way that the sort of, which you see, um, you know, on the streets. But, but I didn't see much of it. I didn't really see that. And, it, and it, they're, like I said, they're reasonable, they're thoughtful. And, um, and I was really proud of them for that. Yeah. Was that your experience as well? 
Uh, I think that's uh, definitely uh, the case. And in my uh, class, I know as uh, for graduate business students, for example, I'm teaching executive MBAs this semester, there's going to be a diversity of, of opinions. And I always tell my students, you're not going to be tested on the thought of Harry Van Buren. <laughs> you're going to be tested about how we apply these sorts of ideas. So what I try to do in a very neutral uh, sort of way is to be descriptive. For example, during the press conference yesterday, uh, President-elect Trump made a comment about the pharmaceutical industry, and pharmaceutical stocks dropped in real time. So to look at elements of political risk and political uh, change, when there's a change in administration, that's going to have an impact on who's the head of various agencies, and that is going to have a direct impact on business. And so I really try to talk allowing for a diversity of opinions, but also to be very descriptive because in a business school, what managers really, future managers or current managers need are very concrete tools to manage the situation that they're in. And Rafael, what about uh, real world things that might change in the next administration? Like let's say deferred action for childhood arrivals, an executive order from President Obama that we're not sure what's gonna happen under President Trump. How do you talk with that with students about the real world impact back here in New Mexico? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, when when I teach uh, students about immigrant rights, about immigration policy and, and those type of things, we always try to think about it in the context historically. For example, when we're talking about the civil rights movement moving on from the 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, we talk about things like um, Pre President Ronald Reagan and his last, the last um, reform that we had in this country and the impact that that had on the country, thinking about economically, um, racially, the, the cultural diversity that has created, but also thinking about currently right now, our, our, our upcoming president and thinking about some of the policies that are coming up. And you know, one of the things that I always try to tell students in the, in the context of social movements is that no matter what president we've had, there's always been resistance, there's always been organizing. And you know, I think for for students and for myself, that's what gives us hope, know, knowing that no matter what president we have, there's gonna be an opposition, there's gonna be different ways of organizing. I mean, um, under President uh, Barack Obama, we had the largest deportation um, you know, practices that any president has had in this country. So even while he uh, provided us with deferred action, there's gotta be that critical engagement of thinking of also detrimental things that have happened under you know, certain presidencies. So you know, in the context of my students, I think uh, social movements and organizing is one of those uh, ways that we could think of where do we go from here, so to speak. And where do we go from here, Mike? What do you think is gonna be different about this semester and what you talk about with students? Well, this semester we're gonna, I, I, this, two things. Um, first of all, we'll, we, now we get to see a president-elect turn into a president and get to see his first 100 days. We're gonna spend very close attention on how President Trump approaches the first 100 days. But because it was a presidential election in the fall, we spent, we spent most of the time, most of our energy when we're talking about current events, incorporating current events on the presidential election. There was a congressional election, but it was hard to, to ignore what was going on, on the presidential side. In the spring, we have to pay close attention to Congress now. We, there's a lot going on in Congress. There's, there's a new Congress. They're gonna be confirming potentially appointments uh, made by the president. There's all gonna be, so we're gonna spend much more time uh, paying attention to what's going on in Congress than we did in the fall. And that's, that's uh, uh, a function of, of how the process is now working. It, we're, you know, there's reason to spend more time on Congress, so now we're gonna do so, which is great, because that's my field. I love it. <laughs> and Finney, this semester you're teaching a class on the intersection of the Black Lives Matter movement and the underground hip hop movement in America. Why, why bring the two of those together, and what do you hope to accomplish in that well, class with students? Well, I think both of, uh, of those subjects, both underground hip hop and the Black Lives Matter movement, they participate, they're the, the leading edge, if you will, and a much longer uh, history of protest and uh, seeking uh, social justice in America, um, in particular within the African American community. And so hip hop has always been a part of Black Lives Matter, at least the underground aspects of that, and vice versa. And so what I want to, to focus on in the spring is how that voice, how hip hop culture and underground rap music serve as a vector for the kind of political ideas that are supported by the Black Lives Matter movement. How, does, how do they work together to, to advance, um, you know, I, I think a, a very different public image of blackness 
than we've seen um, in, in, in recent de uh, decades. Uh, a much more, I think, thoughtful, aggressive, um, perhaps even militant at times um, image. And so it'll be interesting to see how that, how that plays out. Um, and I'm also very interested in what's going to happen in Congress. What about, um, uh, what, what are the, what executive orders will be uh, repealed or put in place mm -hmm. and how those are going to impact um, black communities and then how artists and activists respond to that. Very interesting. Yeah. Harry, for you, what do you think? Well, one of the things I spend a lot of time talking about is how expectations facing business change over time. And often I talk about how agency head uh, changes and uh, executive uh, uh, changes affect the institution of business. But it's easier to talk about that when you see it going on in real time. So when there's a change at the EPA, for example, or a change at the Department of Labor, that's going to have very considerable effects on policies. It's going to have considerable effects on enforcement. And so a lot of what I focus on in my uh, courses when you have an election uh, like this is what's changing in real time. The other thing I try to do is to think about the other side of change when we think about what's affecting business, and that's how society is going to adjust as well too. If the perception, for example, among activists in society is that the federal government is going to let business off the hook, how do stakeholders, how do civil society, how do social movements then step up to try to place independent uh, pressure on businesses and uh, industries? And so that interplay between the uh, political and social movements strikes me as incredibly important. Yes. Rafael, any final thoughts on what you're going to be talking about that's new this semester with students? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the president-elect said that he was going to repeal DACA within the first 20 days. I mean, I, I can't imagine you know, something more important in terms of talking about the Latino uh, community here in New Mexico and in the United States, um, talking about immigrant rights, talking about critical race theory. Um, now that more than ever, I think it's important to ensure that we're, we're going against the banking system in education and actually thinking about producing, you know, critical thinkers um, that are gonna come out into society and make much more impactful decisions. Well, thank you all. There's so much more to talk about. We're going to have to leave it there for this week. Appreciate you joining us for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.